Born in Oxford, England, on January 8, 1942, Stephen Hawking's birth coincidentally occurred exactly three centuries after the passing of the renowned astronomer Galileo Galilei. His parents were both highly educated individuals. His mother, Isabel Eileen Hawking, achieved a degree from the University of Oxford in economics, philosophy, and politics during a time when female graduates were rare. She later served as a medical research secretary. His father, Frank Hawking, also attended Oxford, specializing in tropical diseases. Frank's research led the family to London, but when Isabel became pregnant with Stephen, she moved to Oxford to ensure a safer environment, as London was still recovering from the 1941 Blitz. After Stephen's birth, his family grew to include two younger sisters, Philippa and Mary, and an adopted brother, Edward. Stephen started his schooling at Byron, House School in Highgate, a London suburb, a school known for its progressive teaching methods. Hawking later attributed his initial difficulty in reading until the age of eight to this progressive approach, which de-emphasized rote memorization. When Stephen was eight, his family relocated north of London to St. Albans, Hertfordshire, following his father's appointment as head of the Department of Parasitology at the National Institute for Medical Research. While his father hoped Stephen would pursue a career in medicine, young Stephen's fascination with the cosmos was already evident as he spent much of his time gazing at the stars. The Hawking family had a reputation for eccentricity. Instead of engaging in conversation meals, they would each sigh read books. Their home was large and often disorganized. They kept bees in their basement, and their mode of transport was an old London taxi. Education was highly valued by Stephen's family. At 13, his father aimed for him to attend the prestigious Westminster School. However, Stephen fell ill and was unable to take the scholarship exam. Without it, the family couldn't afford the tuition, so he continued his studies at St. Albans School. This proved to be a fortunate turn, as it was there that he encountered De Grantada, a truly inspiring teacher. Hawking credited Tata with opening his eyes to the fundamental principles of the universe, mathematics. Together, they even constructed Hawking's first computer using old clock parts and a telephone switchboard. Hawking often emphasized the profound impact of teachers, stating, behind every exceptional person, there is an exceptional teacher. Although he initially intended to study mathematics at university, his father expressed concerns about limited job opportunities for math graduates. Stephen ultimately secured a scholarship to study physics at Oxford. During his first 18 months as an undergraduate, he felt unchallenged and found the coursework overly simplistic. He also experienced loneliness and a lack of social engagement. This changed when he joined his college's boat club, where his strong voice and light build made him an ideal coxswain, person who steers the boat. A fellow boat club member noted that Hawking often seemed to be mentally engrossed in complex mathematical equations, as if his head was in the stars. Despite this intellectual intensity, he admitted to a rather relaxed approach to his academic work at Oxford, claiming to study for only about an hour a day. This minimal effort made his final exams particularly challenging and almost prevented him from achieving a first-class degree, which was essential for his desired postgraduate studies at the University of Cambridge. His grades hovered between a first and a second class honor, necessitating an oral examination. During this viva, when asked about his future plans, he famously declared, if you award me a first, I will go to Cambridge. If I receive a second, I shall stay in Oxford, so I expect you will give me a first. In 1962, Hawking was indeed awarded a first-class bachelor's degree in physics and subsequently began his graduate work at Cambridge, focusing on cosmology, the study of the universe. He was initially disappointed to be assigned physicist Dennis Siyama as his supervisor, having hoped for the more celebrated astronomer Fred Hoyle. However, this perceived setback proved to be advantageous. Unlike Hoyle, who was often absent from the department, Siyama was consistently available and eager to discuss ideas, which greatly stimulated Hawking's scientific development. Furthermore, Hoyle was a vocal critic of the Big Bang Theory, a concept he mockingly named to discredit the idea of a universe with a definite beginning. Shyama, conversely, encouraged Hawking to explore the origins of time. Before he could fully immerse himself in his research, Hawking received devastating news. He had noticed increasing clumsiness during his time at Oxford, including a fall down some stairs, which a doctor initially dismissed as a result of excessive beer consumption. However, in 1963, while at Cambridge, Hawking was diagnosed with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, 
ALS, also known as motor neuron disease. This condition progressively paralyzes individuals by severing the brain's control over muscles. Doctors predicted he had only two years to live. He was just 21 years old. Hawking plunged into a deep depression, feeling his academic pursuits were pointless. In his memoir, My Brief History, he wrote, I felt it was very unfair. Why should this happen to me? At the time, I thought my life was over and that I would never realize the potential I felt I had. Yet, the disease's progression was slower than anticipated. Siyama encouraged Hawking to resume his research, and it was this work that revolutionized our understanding of black holes, perfectly spherical regions of space formed when a star collapses. Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity, which describes how gravity warps spacetime, had predicted black holes. Their gravitational pull is so immense that nothing, not even light, can escape, and they distort their surroundings like a funhouse mirror. Interestingly, Einstein himself remained somewhat unconvinced of the existence of these enigmatic cosmic entities. The rigorous mathematical work of British mathematician Sir Roger Penrose demonstrated that Einstein's general theory of relativity indeed predicts the formation of black holes, an achievement for which he received a Nobel Prize in 2020. Hawking developed a strong fascination with black holes, leading to significant discoveries, notably that they are entirely dark. He found that they emit a faint glow just beyond the event horizon, the point of no return where a black hole's gravity becomes inescapable. This gradual emission, now known as Hawking radiation, suggested that black holes would slowly evaporate. Over immense periods, Hawking also enjoyed making wagers concerning black holes. He and physicist Kip Thorne bet that black holes permanently destroy any information they consume, while physicist John Preskill argued that this information could be retrieved through the radiation. While this paradox remains unresolved, Hawking eventually conceded the bet, gifting Preskill a baseball encyclopedia as a humorous acknowledgement. Hawking leveraged his insights into black holes to address a profound cosmological question, the origin of our universe. Inspired by Penrose's work showing that a singularity, a point where space and time cease to exist, lies deep within a black hole, Hawking applied this concept to the universe as a whole. He proposed that the universe also originated from a singularity, lending further support to the Big Bang Theory, which posits that the universe began from a single point in time. However, this did not imply a divine creator for Hawking. He famously wrote, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. It is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going. The blue touch paper is a metaphor for igniting fireworks. In contrast, Georges Lemaitre, widely recognized as the father of the Big Bang Theory, held a different view, believing that the law of gravity itself was a divine creation. Hawking was known to contemplate the existence of God, once telling Reuters that, the laws may have been decreed by God, but God does not intervene to break the laws. Ultimately, however, he identified as an atheist, though he found love with a Christian. Stephen first encountered Jane Wilde at a party in their shared hometown of St. Albans. He was a physics student at Cambridge, and she was studying English at the University of London. Their meeting occurred around the time of his grim health prognosis. Hawking credited Jane with providing him a reason to live. Despite initial expectations of a short time together, they married in 1965 and their union lasted 30 years, during which they had three children. His worsening health placed immense strain on their marriage. Jane often spoke of drawing strength from her faith as she took on the role of his primary caregiver, assisting with everything from feeding and dressing to bathing and accompanying him on numerous hospital visits. However, she also revealed another source of marital tension, stating, the truth was, there were four of us in our marriage, Stephen and me, motor neuron disease and physics. She felt increasingly isolated from his scientific pursuits, which continued unabated despite his physical decline. As he lost the ability to write, Hawking developed remarkable new ways of conceptualizing complex equations entirely within his mind. One physicist likened this feat to Mozart composing an entire symphony internally. Although the debilitating disease progressively robbed him of mobility and clear speech, his intellect remained exceptionally keen. At 32, he was elected to the Royal Society, the UK's prestigious National Science Academy. In 1979, he achieved the distinguished position of Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge, a highly renowned academic chair previously held by Sir Isaac Newton. Hawking delivered lectures and speeches using a computer-generated voice. 
he later chose to retain this synthetic voice, even when more natural-sounding options became available, as it had become his distinctive characteristic. He did not completely lose his natural speech until 1985, when he contracted pneumonia during a trip to a research center in Switzerland. His condition became so critical that he required life support. When doctors suggested removing his ventilator, Jane steadfastly refused. A tracheotomy was performed, involving an incision in his neck and insertion of a breathing tube, which unfortunately eliminated his remaining speech. To communicate, he initially used a spelling card, selecting letters by raising his eyebrows. Subsequently, he received a computer program from American engineer Walter Waltos, whose mother also suffered from ALS. This allowed Hawking to select words from a database with a click. However, as he lost control of his hand, he resorted to twitching his cheek muscle to make selections, a painfully slow process that yielded only one or two words per minute. This led him to seek assistance from Intel. Researchers at Intel collaborated with SwiftKey, a London-based startup, to develop a cutting-edge system designed to interpret his intentions similar to a smartphone's predictive text feature. SwiftKey's word predictor analyzed Hawking's vast collection of papers to understand his writing patterns. For instance, if he selected black, the system would often anticipate whole as the next word. It was this technological innovation that enabled Hawking to publish his groundbreaking research in book form. His most famous work, A Brief History of Time, released in 1988, sold a million copies first year alone. Despite its complex subject matter, A Brief History of Time achieved remarkable popularity, even with Hawking deliberately limiting the inclusion of equations to just Einstein's iconic EMMC2 to broaden its appeal. While already a recognized figure before its publication, the book transformed Hawking into a global celebrity. He made appearances on popular shows like The Simpsons, The Big Bang Theory, and Star Trek, cultivating a cult-like following. He also possessed a mischievous side, with rumors suggesting he would playfully run over the toes of those who irked him with his wheelchair, Prince Charles reportedly being one such victim. His newfound fame brought both his professional achievements and personal life under intense scrutiny. Hawking eventually left Jane for Elaine Mason, one of his nurses. Interestingly, Mason's husband was the engineer responsible for attaching Hawking's speech synthesizer to his wheelchair. Hawking stated that he became increasingly unhappy with the close relationship between Jane and Jonathan Jones, a local church organist who had moved in with the Hawkings when Stephen's early death was anticipated, and Jane sought someone to help support their children. Jane and Jonathan married after Stephen and Elaine tied the knot in 1995. Hawking's second marriage reportedly caused friction with his children. This marriage also ended in divorce after a decade. Following this, Hawking re-established a closer bond with his first wife and children. In an interview with Diane Sawyer on ABC News, he shared his most crucial advice to his children. 1. Remember to look up at the stars and not down at your f 2. Never give up work. Work gives you meaning and purpose, and life is empty without it. 3. If you are lucky enough to find love, remember it is rare and don't throw it away. He also offered a more general message to the world. However difficult life may seem, there is always something you can do and succeed at. It matters that you don't just give up. He once humorously rephrased this at the University of Oxford, saying, if you feel you are in a black hole, don't give up. After five decades of living with ALS, Stephen Hawking peacefully passed away at his home on March 14, 2018, at the age of 76. His funeral was held at a church in Cambridge,